Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We're going to begin today with a test, a spiritual test, to see where you are before God. Are you drawing close to Him or are you moving the wrong direction? And here's the only test question. What are you more interested in? Signs and wonders or the truth of God? If you are someone who is pursuing the supernatural, miracles, signs, and wonders, realize something. You are in a very dangerous position. Because when you chase after the signs and the wonders, realize that the enemy is going to deceive you. You are going to be easily moved away from where God wants you to be in order to accomplish those things that are in conflict with what's best for you spiritually and your call from God. That is the things that you should be doing. So let me ask you again, what interests you the most? See, today when I look at much of television, Christian television, and what I see the most popular books and such, I see all too often an emphasis on the supernatural. When biblically, It is truth that should lead us and guide us. And of course, when we are walking in truth, then God will move. Our God is a miraculous God. He does indeed do signs and wonders, but the pursuit must be for truth, for heavenly revelation. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 16. The book of Matthew and chapter 16. In this passage, we're going to see that our Messiah, that is Lord Yeshua, Jesus Christ, he is going to have another encounter with leaders from Jerusalem, those Pharisees and the Sadducees, and realize something. These two different groups were just that, very different groups. They had theology that were widely, widely in disagreement with one another. So how could they serve among the Sanhedrin, that ruling council? They had one thing in common, and that was this. They wanted power. They wanted wealth. They were choosing to put first the things of this world instead of the things of God. Look with me to to verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, after coming, and this word means coming before, coming to someone. And we also find why they were coming, and the context is this. They were coming before Yeshua. And why? Simply it says, and testing. Now, they were testing him not for the purpose of learning. They wanted to put a stumbling block before him. They wanted to test him in order to cause him to to stumble. They weren't interested in the truth. They wanted to see another miracle. He had been doing, and we've been studying this, miracle after miracle. So they come wanting to test him, and they asked him for a sign from heaven. And again, we see repeatedly, he had been doing signs and wonders. He had performed miracle after miracle. And in order to rightly understand this, we need to pay attention to the context. What is given in order to help us rightly understand the message of this text. 
we're going to see in the next passage, which is a continuation, we're going to see that there was an emphasis upon two specific miracles that Yeshua did. And they were different, but they were similar in the supernatural outcome. And what am I speaking about? The feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. In other words, people received bread, food, freely. They received it supernaturally. And this captured the attention of the Pharisees and the scribes. They liked receiving without doing anything. And therefore, they came seeking, as the scripture says, from Yeshua, a sign from the heavens that he would manifest. And this means to show them, but the context is to show them personally. They wanted to be the recipients of. Look now to to verse 2. But, and again, this is this, this conjunction that shows a contrast but in contrast to what they wanted, these Pharisees and Sadducees. We read, but he answered and said to them, becoming evening, you say, fair weather. For the heaven, and this means the sky, for the sky is red, but also morning time. What do they say? They say, today, There will be a storm. Why? For the sky is red and gloomy. So they were able to look at the sky and understand the implications of what they had seen. And notice the next word still in verse 3. Now, the best Greek manuscripts have the phrase hypocrites. But if you're looking at a Bible an English translation, and it doesn't have it. It's because your translation follows what's called the Nestle Allen Greek text. And we know something normally. Things, they, they fall out over time. And we know that originally, based upon other times that Yeshua said hypocrites, frequently, I want to emphasize that, Frequently, when he spoke to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the scribes, he addressed them, as we've seen and as we'll continue to see, hypocrites. Why? Well, the context is very clear. He's saying, when you look at earthly things, such as weather, things of this world, you know how to discern them. You have understanding based upon the past, but... When it comes to spiritual things, keep reading the second part of verse 3. He says, hypocrites, the face, and this means the appearance of of the sky. You, You know how to judge. But, in contrast to that, but the signs of the seasons. And here we're talking about prophetic seasons. Being able to discern things based upon God's prophetic calendar. He says, you are not able. And why is that? Why do they have this inability when they are smart, they're intelligent, they're able to discern the things of this world, but not prophetic indicators? Why is that? Notice what he says in verse 4. An evil generation and adulteress. So when he looks at his time, He sees a generation, that means the people, were evil and adulterous. Evil, not interested in the things of God, and adulterous, that is moving into spirituality of the wrong origin. And when I look at this world today, I can say that same thing. We are living in a time when culture is becoming full of, of that which is evil. By the way, the word here for evil is porneia. It's where we get the English word pornography, and it speaks about sexual immorality. And more and more, 
In this world, we see a sanctioning and embracing of that which is sexually immoral, that which is outside the parameters that the Word of God sets. And it's interesting because today, if you take a stand for sexual morality and you speak against that which is in conflict with the Word of God, for example, adultery, as he mentions, fornication, and what else? Homosexuality. If you speak out today against homosexuality, you are going to be labeled, if you're part of a group that takes that stand, you are part of, from a worldly perspective, a hate group. So what? Don't let what the world labels you influence you. You stand for truth. Don't be concerned with how others see you remember something. One of my favorite names is the name Daniel. The name Daniel means God is my judge. Remember that always. You don't have to give an account to anyone because they ultimately don't judge you. Your judge is one, God, Messiah Yeshua. And therefore, embrace his standards and not the standards of, as Messiah said, an evil and adulterous generation. Such a generation, notice what it says, seeks a sign. Now, I want to go off on a tangent that I believe is very important. Unfortunately, today, we see many men of God fall spiritually into sexual immorality. And I have noticed something frequently. There is a, a, a consistent, among them, a consistent uh, emphasis on signs and wonders, the supernatural rather than on the truth of God. See, when we emphasize the supernatural, what did I say at the beginning? You're going to be deceived. You're going to be moved to that which is against God. And that's what's happening. That's why it's so important to embrace truth. So a evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but Messiah says no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. What is that? Well, we've talked about this before. The sign of Jonah is a resurrection. See, the Bible says in the book of Jonah chapter 2, look at the very beginning. We are told there that Jonah descended down, down until, and here's the key, the word that is used there in the Hebrew text is the word Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead. Jonah died when he was in that belly of the fish three days and three nights. He died, but he resurrected from the dead. And that's why Messiah says to these Pharisees and Sadducees, no signs going to be given to you except the sign of Jonah. What was he referring to? His resurrection. And after teaching that, notice the end of verse 4. Now, if we look at it literally, and that's what I'm doing, it says something that's awkward, so awkward, that all the English translations, they just ignore what it says. Let me translate it literally. And you'll see that it's confusing, but when the scripture is confusing, there's a purpose for that. There's wisdom. There's revelation in that. Verse 4, at the end it says, and, and it's a, a participle that's in the aorist, that is the passive, or excuse me, the past. And what that means is, and after leaving them, he departed. Now, that doesn't make sense. But when something doesn't make sense, there's a reason for it. It's to emphasize his absolute departure from them. He wanted nothing to do with them because they were sincere. They were seeking signs rather than revelation. They weren't interested in the truth. And when you are not interested in God's truth, and where do we find God's truth? Right here in the Word of God, Scripture. So many times I hear people get up and they start teaching, and what are they referring to? 
what someone else has said, what's written in some book, some other thing that they have witnessed or some testimony. We need to be people that root everything, have everything established and founded upon the Word of God if we don't want to be led astray, if we don't want to be weak spiritually. And what happens when we're weak spiritually? That enemy comes, he, he tempts us, and what happens? We stumble and fall, and we have an improper, a, a shameful testimony rather than a God-pleasing testimony. So he departs, having left them, he went away, emphasizing he wanted nothing to do with them. Look now to verse 5. And his disciples, having went to the other side. Now, they traveled, and notice what it says. They forgot bread to take these loaves. They had, in other words, no food. They were thinking about what? Food. And the word here is indeed the word for bread, referring to those loaves. Remember the context. The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. They were thinking about the fact they had no food. But, verse 6, Yeshua said to them, Watch out and beware from the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, he mentions leaven. And we're going to see that the disciples, they didn't get what he was saying. What he was doing by using the term leaven, and this is the same word for yeast. You all know, a little bit of yeast, and we see this in the scripture. It works through the whole lump, and although you don't see it initially working, later on it affects everything. And that's what happens when we have the wrong teaching when we're not following the truth of God. See, the enemy, and I'm speaking about the Antichrist, one of my favorite books in all the Bible is the book of Revelation. And when we look at the book of Revelation, we find that that false prophet, we find that that Antichrist, what does he do? Signs, great signs, heavenly signs, meaning he does things causing fire to come down from the heaven. And what happens? Those who belong to this world, those who are committed to this world, those who are motivated by signs and wonders, they are led astray by him. So Messiah warns his disciples. He says, uh, look out, beware from the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. They heard him talking about yeast, leaven, and once again they thought about bread, the earthly for they were reasoning among themselves, saying, because bread we have not taken. We didn't bring bread. This is why he mentions the yeast. Far from it. He is warning them. And here's the problem. Because they're thinking of the natural, the things of this world, they're thinking not on their heart, but on their stomach. They were concerned. We did not take bread. Did not they understand that with Messiah, he is not dependent upon the natural. He is able to take and create. That's his nature. He is able to meet needs, all physical needs. We don't need to be worried about that. But the disciples, they, were, they didn't have the proper focus. And you need to ask yourself, and I continuously need to ask myself, do I have the right focus? Am I emphasizing the things that are important to him? So they were reasoning among themselves. It's because we did not take bread. Look now to verse, verse 8. But, here again in contrast to their thoughts, but Yeshua, that's Jesus, Knowing, and the implication is knowing completely, knowing everything. There's no surprise to him. Yeshua, knowing, he said to them, 
Why are you reasoning among yourselves? And notice what he says to them. He uses two words for one little or few. And the second word for faith. It's in the plural, so he says, you. Those of you who are of little faith. Because you did not take bread, you think that's the issue? Are you not understanding? Literally, are you still not understanding? And do you not remember? What does he want them to remember? The miracles. Yeshua, he has done, considered the book of John. John's gospel says that if all the miracles, those signs that Yeshua did in those three and a half years, if they were all written down in a book, there would be so many books that the world itself could not contain it. He did many miracles. What do we need to do? Understand those miracles. Remember what he's done and apply the truth, the truth of those miracles to our life. So he says, are you still not understanding, nor do you remember, and notice what he says, the five loaves and the 5,000? And he asks a question, how many baskets or fragments did you take up? And then he says, and not the seven loaves and the 4,000, and how many large baskets did you take up? And let's talk about this for a moment because we learned something. When he fed 5,000, how many baskets were taken up of fragments? The answer is 12. And then from seven loaves, he fed 4,000 people. And how many large baskets were taken up? The answer is seven. So we see when we look at the baskets, we see the numbers 12 and 7. 12, the people of God, Israel. But 7 has to do with holiness or the purpose of God. What he's saying to them is this. Stop being so concerned about the things of this world. What you'll eat, what you'll wear, where you'll live, all these earthly things. He says the Gentiles, and when he says Gentiles, you know what he means? Those who have no covenant with God. One of the definitions in the new covenant for Gentile is an individual that has no covenantal relationship with God. And when you don't have a covenantal relationship with God, you know what you're not going to be interested in? Well, let me ask you a question. What is a covenant? It's an agreement, but inside that covenant are promises, the promises of God. So when you are a covenant individual with God, you are going to be thinking about the promises of God. And the promises of God are connected to the will of God. So you are going to be committed to the will of God in your pursuit of the promises of God. And what he's saying here is this, the number 12 and 7, Israel needs to be concerned about the purpose. Holiness is related to purpose, God's purpose. Israel, the people of God, needs to be concerned with the purpose of God. So let me ask you, as a follower of Messiah, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, you are brought into, Paul says, the commonwealth of Israel. You belong to the covenant people of God. God in his providence, God in his love, in his mercy, he took this message of salvation and he sent it to all the nations, all people, all tribes, all languages. So everyone, the scripture says God's not a respecter of persons. He loves everyone. No favorites. He took that message of the gospel to all people so that we can be individuals that are part of the family of God and are committed to the purposes of God. And let me assure you of this. If your life 
is not committed to the purposes of God, if you're not pursuing the things that are important to God with your life, well, you may have wealth, you may have fortune and fame, you may have a degree of, of worldly satisfaction. But I assure you of this, when that judgment day comes, you're going to be utterly, completely unprepared for that. And here's the truth. Your life is short. The scripture says it is a vapor. Even if you live 80, 90, 100, up to 120 years, what is that compared to eternity? So don't put the emphasis of your life on 30, 40 years of being an adult, 50 years, whatever, but put it upon the eternity. And you demonstrate your commitment to the eternity when you're committed to the purposes of God. Look again. He says to them, how many did you take up? Now, verse, verse 11. He says, how is it that you're not understanding? that not concerning bread I spoke to you. Beware from the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, when I said that, I was not speaking about bread, something to eat. I was warning you concerning a wrong way of thinking. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they were committed to the things of this world, they wrapped them up spiritually, religiously, but nevertheless, their heart, their motivation. See, instead of coming to bless Yeshua, what did they do? They come, came testing him. And remember that word means to test for the purpose of putting a stumbling block, causing someone to, to fall. Many have interpreted this to misuse the power of God for pleasing a man. No, we use the power, the provision of God for pleasing God. Now, oftentimes that means blessing individuals. Well, let's conclude. Look at our final verse, verse 12. Then they understood that it was not that he said, beware from the leaven of bread, but... From, and here's the key, from the teaching, the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And let me wrap up this session by asking you one last question, and that is this. What doctrine are you basing your life upon? So many people 2,000 years ago in Israel followed the Pharisees and the Sadducees rather than the one who spoke the truth of God. Build your life on the right doctrine shalom from israel well we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org again to find out more about us please visit our website loveisrael.org there you will find articles and numerous other lectures by baruch these teachings are in video form you may download them or watch them in streaming video until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.